video, we're going to take a look at the movement of blood through the blood vessels. There are three principles that control the major functions of the circulatory system. One, blood flow to each tissue of the body is controlled according to the tissue's needs. Tissues and the vessels that go to it, the microvessels, which are the arterioles and the capillaries, can figure out how much blood that tissue needs. So for example, if you are working out, your skeletal muscle is going to need a lot more blood flow than if you're just sitting on a couch. So depending on what the tissue's needs are at that time, will very much control how much blood it gets. Two, cardiac output is a sum of all the local tissue's blood flow. The heart will only pump out what the tissues send back. What I mean by this is if the tissues are using the blood, the heart needs that blood back to push it out. So the cardiac output, how much blood the heart pushes out, is dictated by how much blood is sent back to the heart by the tissues. And three, arterial pressure is usually controlled independently of local blood flow or cardiac output control. We're going to now take a look at some different aspects of blood flow. And unfortunately, we have one or two equations in the mix. You should not have to be able to do any math based on these equations, but you should be able to understand what the equations mean as far as principles. So let's take a look at blood flow. We have F equals triangle P slash R. What does that mean? Well, I'm not exactly reading it correctly to you, okay? F equals, that triangle is called a delta. Delta means change, means that there's a difference somewhere. So F equals delta P over R. The F is the blood flow. It's the movement of blood. It's the measurement of the actual movement of blood. And we measure it in milliliters per minute, or ml over minute. The delta P is the difference in pressure. See, difference delta is difference di change of. Delta P is the difference in pressure between the two ends of the vessels. What I mean by this is blood will only flow if there's a difference in pressure from one end to the other end. If both ends, now we're not talking about within, think of a, a garden hose for a second. We're not talking about the pressure in the garden hose. We're talking about the pressure at one end to the other end. If there is no difference between this and this, there's no flow. There has to be a difference between this end and this end for there to be a flow of the blood. So if we have a high pressure here and a low pressure here, the blood's gonna flow that way. Again, if the pressure is high over here and low over here, it's gonna go this way. So there has to be a difference in pressure. So that delta P is difference in pressure at the end of those vessels, of those hoses, all right? It's measured in millimeters of mercury. And finally, the R stands for resistance. If somebody is resisting you, it means that they are not going along with you. They are blocking you. Resistance, in this case, is the resistance to the flow of blood. And yes, there is resistance in our circulatory system. We measure resistance in millimeters of mercury over milliliters per minute. So when we put all this together, blood flow is how much of a difference it is from one end of the tube to the other, as well as how much resistance it's facing. So let's put this together. If we have a garden hose, and there's a huge difference here, let's say you turn the water on on the house, okay? You got this garden hose and you turn the water on at your house, and the water starts to flow, and you're standing at the other end with your garden hose and there's no water coming out. And you're going, wait, the water's, there's a difference in pressure. There's no pressure here, and there's a lot of pressure over there. Why is there no water coming out? And then you look down the garden hose, and you see that the garden hose has been twisted and bent. That bent is a huge amount of resistance. So no matter what the pressure difference is, that resistance is high enough, nothing's getting through. And so you open up the, the kink in it, you, you unwind the garden hose, and now the water comes out. So this is blood vessels. Difference in pressure from one end to the other end will allow movement, 
but if we increase resistance along that vessel large enough, it will prevent the blood from getting through. The next concept I want to talk about is heart action. The heart moves blood. Kind of a duh, well we know the heart moves blood. We got that in the last series of lessons, all right? The two measurements that we look at as far as heart moving blood is stroke volume and cardiac output. Stroke volume is defined as the amount of blood pushed out of the heart with each ventricular contraction. So when the ventricles contract, remember that's the bottom part of the heart, the bigger part that really does the squeezing, how much blood is every squeeze doing? How much blood is that squeeze pushing out? How much blood, if you grabbed the heart and squeezed it, let's say you, you, you know, Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom moment, you reached in, grabbed someone's heart out, pull it out and squeezed it and just, rah, how much blood left the heart? That is your stroke volume. How much blood did you just squeeze out of that heart? Stroke volume is approximately seven milliliters in the typical mythological male at rest. So the typical stroke volume is 70 milliliters. Then we have cardiac output. So great, we've reached in, we've grabbed the heart, we've squeezed it out, that was your stroke volume. Now, imagine if we did that for a minute. How much blood is leaving that heart in that minute? This is cardiac output. How much blood is being squeezed out over a minute's time? This is actually another equation. Cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So stroke volume again, is how much blood we squished out. Heart rate is how fast your heart's beating. And we take those two times it, and that's where we get the amount of blood that's getting out of the heart over the course of a minute. It averages about five liters per minute at rest. Then we have blood volume, how much blood is in the body. It includes the plasma and the formed elements. Plasma is the liquid, formed elements are the things dissolved in the blood or the solids in the blood. So for example, your red blood cells, your white blood cells. Around five liters for adults or around 8% of body weight in kilograms. So in your body, you have about five liters of blood. We have an approximate distribution of the blood. About 84% of the blood is found in the systemic circulatory system. That again is a system that goes from your heart to your toes and back up. So the majority of your blood is found in the systemic circuit of the cardiovascular system. Breaking that down even further, 64% of that blood is found within the veins. Remember, veins hold a ton of blood. Well, maybe not tons, but liters, all right? It's gonna contain 65% of the blood. 13% of the blood can be found in the arteries. 7% can be found in the systemic arterioles and the capillaries. 7% is found in the heart. And 9% of the total blood volume is found in the pulmonary vessels. So 84% you find in the systemic, around 9%, remember these are approximations, are found in the pulmonary vessels. Then we talked about resistance to blood earlier, so resistance to flow. When blood is first ejected from the heart during ventricular contraction, this is your systolic pressure, the big squeeze, the elastic walls of the artery systems expand, then bounce back. So the heart goes whoosh, the arteries go wow, they widen open, and then when the heart's done pumping, they push that blood back down. So you have that initial big push, the arteries respond to it, the blood's being pushed, the blood's being moved via the systemic, not the systemic, but the ventricular contraction, the systolic contraction, and then when that's over, when the heart's refilling, the arteries are elastic and they start to push that blood as well. So it's almost like breathing out through your, your chest, going, filling your cheeks with air, right? So you fill your cheeks with air and you blow out, and you're done breathing out, but then you take the air that's in your cheeks and you just the rest of the way. That's kind of what's going on here. So big stretch, heart's done pushing the blood out, the arteries will contract back, they'll go back to their normal shape and diameter, and as they're doing that, the blood continues to move because it continues the pressure along the blood. As blood moves along the blood vessels, it encounters friction against the walls of the vessels. So as the blood is moving, it has to rub against things, i.e. the blood vessel walls. This is known as peripheral resistance. 
Again, we have vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Vasoconstriction is getting a smaller diameter. It's constricting it, which is going to increase the resistance, while vasodilation, opening up, is going to decrease the resistance. It's going to make the blood flow even easier. Vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Vasoconstriction, we are talking about the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight. So when the sympathetic kicks in, it's going to send that signal and it's going to cause those vessels to constrict, vasoconstriction. In fact, this ability to vasoconstrict is so powerful that a person can lose up to 25% of their total blood volume and we're still work in the system. The system is still working. Obviously, if you have a loss of up to 25% of your blood, you are hemorrhaging, you've been hurt, you've suffered trauma, this is the body's ability or trying to keep you alive. So you get a huge cut, it's going to vasoconstrict, it's going to try to cut blood off to that area and keep the other blood flowing the way it should be. Vasodilation is more of a passive process. Vasoconstriction requires the smooth muscles to tighten up. Vasodilation just needs the smooth muscles to relax. Just, you know, chill. Don't do anything. You know, what do I need to do? Nothing. Just kind of chill and they open up and you have vasodilation. Remember that there's always an opposite reaction. We can't have constriction of blood vessels in some part of the body without dilation somewhere else. Okay? We have to have a constriction along with a dilation somewhere else. Blood volume cannot change rapidly on its own. Obviously, if you chop off an arm, you're going to have a blood change volume rapidly. But on its own, blood volume cannot change rapidly, not counting trauma, and blood is not compressible, so you can't squish down the blood. Viscosity. Viscosity is a measurement of how easy molecules can flow past each other. When you hear viscosity, I want you to think of the difference of water versus maple syrup. Okay. How fast does water flow? If you take a cup of water and dump it over, it's going out. If you take maple syrup and turn it over, you might be waiting. It's kind of slowly slide down the side of the bottle. The greater the viscosity, the increased resistance to flow. This kind of makes sense. If, it, if, if maple syrup doesn't move very quickly, that's going to be increased resistance. There's a lot of resistance there. So the increase in viscosity of the blood the higher the resistance, thus, the need to increase the pressure to move that blood along. Major contributors to blood viscosity are erythrocyte count and albumin concentrations. We're talking about blood cell count and we're also talking about protein count. Blood is about three times greater than the viscosity of water due largely to the red blood cells found within the blood. Which brings up our last point that I want to make, and that is about the hematocrit. It is the percentage of blood made of cells, typically around 40%. 40% are cells within the blood, while 60% is plasma, which is the fluid that makes up the blood. And we will get into blood on its own series of lessons in the next series of cardiovascular system videos. Increased number of cells in blood, which increases the hematocrit which therefore increases viscosity, which therefore increases resistance to blood flow. So the body really needs to keep these in balance. And when we get into the urinary system, we find that the urinary system's primary function is to regulate composition of the blood.